Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. We'd like to give a special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. And for more information about Perpetual Chess, you can go to PerpetualChessPod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Adult Improver edition of Perpetual Chess. Before I introduce this week's guest, I did want to give a quick shout out to recent Patreon subs of Perpetual Chess. Of course, those who help support Perpetual Chess financially and join the community can submit questions for guests. We've got a few good ones this week. They can access ad-free podcasts, join the Perpetual Chess Discord. We do occasional Zoom hangouts. So I hope that it is fun. Uh, And of course, most importantly, they're helping to support the podcast. So I hope that it is fun. And I wanted to give a shout out to recent subs, uh, Mihir Sawant, Mikhail Kibinich, Che Martin, Ray Minahan, uh, Vojcik Dobel, I hope I said that remotely right, Vojcik, uh, Keith Bass, Alexander Mikhailishuk, Laura Smith, Paul Ferris, Steve Register, and Colin Reed. And having... Uh, your attention. I also wanted to remind you guys to subscribe to my free chess weekly newsletter every Friday. I send out the best chess links. Um, And lately, it's been taking more of a chess improvement focus. So I think if you enjoy the adult improver pods, you will enjoy this. There's been more and more great free writing about chess improvement. So encourage you guys to all subscribe to get uh, a free weekly email from the Perpetual Chess Link Fest. It is basically unaffiliated with this podcast, but I do think anyone listening to this would enjoy it. But without further ado, let's get to our guest. So our guest is a YouTube creator, um, and through his channel and his chess.com forum, he's built a community around helping players, especially in the rating range 500 to 1200. And our guest, of course, is a chess junkie himself. And he's seen slow and steady progress in his own game. He took his chess.com rapid rating from the 1100s to the 1500s consistently with a high over 1600. And I know that he is popular within the community because he's been suggested as a guest a few times in recent years. Uh, so I am glad to welcome to the show, Ben Hunt. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, on the show. Very excited. Yeah, I've been, yeah, I'm, I'm excited too. I've been checking out your videos. Um, again, I've been getting uh, emails about you for, for more than a year. So it was good to get to check it out and see what all the, uh, the buzz is about. So Ben, you did give me a little bit of background about your chess, um, via email and you said you got into it within the last five years and i looked at your chess.com rapid graph and it's very easy to see the moment where you got into it because it's like a flat line and then it's just buzzing all over the place consistently so um my my first question for you ben is what was it were you learning the game from scratch or were you rediscovering it and what peaked or re-peaked your interest in chess well no uh i wasn't learning from scratch my mother taught me to play chess when i was about seven years old uh, she'd sit with sit with me in bed with a obviously a, a real board with real pieces and she taught me the moves and uh I, I i learned it from there i played a little bit joined a couple of chess clubs at school over the years and then pretty much just forgot about it when i was an adult until about five years ago when i was just sitting there bored one day and i thought hey you should be able to play chess online right Surely there's uh, some, something you can do. And I, I loaded up chess.com and uh, joined probably with a free account. And within days, I was absolutely hooked. Because it's, it's That's one, funny, just like an idle thought that, that yeah. <laughs> alters the trajectory of your life. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. But it, it, it's something that really, really suits my personality. Because I, I think my mum decided to teach me the game because I was a, like a precocious, intelligent little boy that uh, struggled to, to concentrate on everything. I was really interested in a lot of stuff. She, she just thought that I'd, I'd be really suited to the game. And uh, quite honestly, after I got back into it, I realized, wow, this is, this is it, it's like the ultimate game. And to be honest, even you know, five years later, I'm finding more beauty in it and, and even more challenge in it because you keep peeling back layers. You think you've got somewhere with learning some principles and um, and some tactics, but it's it's bottomless. It really is. And so, if you're looking for a challenge, a a, a cerebral challenge, then 
this really is the ultimate one, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Um, it's daunting at times because no matter where you go, you have so much further to go. But that's also what makes it uh, beautiful. Yeah. And so, Ben, once you did get reinterested, you're playing on chess.com. Um, what was your first step to actually try to get better? Oh, wow. Um, I, I, I think I was just pretty much self-directed. So I went through chess.com's got some pretty good tutorials. The puzzles on there are, are really good. Um, I mean, I've ended up buying a bunch of books over the years, but I'll confess, I, I don't think I've ever finished one of them. <laughs> like uh, Jeremy Silman. You've got plenty of company. Yeah. Oh, man. Silman's book, you know, um, on, on the imbalances, Mastering Chess Through, through Chess Imbalances is, is uh, fantastic. I, 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 I've, I've also hired a, a few coaches over the years, probably four coaches, done a few sessions here and there. But I really realized that, that, that there's, I, I found there was a limit to, to, to what I could learn from, from coaches because it really did come down to, to mastering the basics. And I, I found that I, I learned really well from watching videos. And there's some amazing chess content out there for free on the web. It's not all, always very structured. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, it's, I, th I think the, the biggest thing that, that I did was to, instead of just hitting new game every time I won or lost, but to go back and try and analyze my games and to try and understand why. Why did I lose or why did my opponent lose that game? Yeah, and the game review f functions make it so easy these days. But uh, I have a follow up on the the content. So I, I mean, of course, I agree with you. There's just so much, uh, such an incredible array of uh, free content online. But what were some of your early favorites, and uh, and what are your favorites as we move forward to? Oh, great question! Uh, right now, uh, I I think that the first creator that I came across was uh, Grandmaster Simon Williams with Ginger GM. Uh, I got on really helpful. Nice. Well. Obviously, we speak the same language, which helps. And so I, I followed him a lot. Um, and more recently, I've got into uh, Alex Banzer is great. Uh, I've, a lot of the main ones. St. Louis Chess Club has, has been wonderful over the time. I think my, my go-to, my, my breakfast chess now is um, Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky. I, I absolutely, I think he's, he's an exception among top title players because... He has the ability to, and uh, for, for one thing, he, he plays slower games, which is really useful. I mean, so many people go onto Twitch or go onto YouTube, and we can watch people like Hikaru playing Blitz at the speed of light and calculating at the speed of light and, and really weaving arrows all over the board. But there's very little I found that I could actually get from, from watching chess played at that speed. But Naroditsky has, has a great talent, and... Simon Williams and, and lots of other players who, who do include longer format games where they have the time to explain the whole thought process. But it, it's also, it's not just grandmaster level thinking that they're explaining. They, they manage to, to, to lead the trail back to what a, a beginner or an intermediate player can actually find accessible, which I think is, is really, really useful. So yeah, I think uh, Naroditsky is really my, my, my go-to at the way I follow. Jonathan Schrantz and, and plenty of others as well. John Bartholomew was an early influence also. Obviously, Gotham Chess as well. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've got great taste. Yeah. And Nar I mean, they're they're all great and I'm fans of them all. But Naroditsky in particular, what strikes me about him is um, he's it's it's such a rare combination to be a world class bullet player to have your mind able to work that quickly uh, and then also to be like a world-class teacher, an explainer of ideas. I mean, it's almost like a disparate skill set, but somehow he's able to, to pull it all together. So shout out to Daniel. Yeah, it's just uh, um, incredibly impressive. Um, but then, Ben, you've gotten into to content creation on your own, um, really helping people who are newer in their chess journey, which um, I think is, is much needed and appreciated. Um, and actually, we have a listener question that sort of dives right into sort of the, um, the backbone of uh, the content you present. So I'm going to read this question, but then um, before we answer it, 
more widely, I want you to explain what the goldfish fish method is, although I did watch your video, but we'll let you do the explaining. But first, let me read the question. It's from Michael Spisner. Thanks for supporting uh, the pod via Patreon, Michael. And he says, I loved your video, The Way of the Goldfish, from about two years ago, but I've noticed that you don't consistently apply the principles. Can you talk a little about why adult improvers often fail to consistently apply the rules and principles they know are best? Michael says it certainly applies for him as well. Uh, So let's begin with what's the goldfish method and then get into Michael's question. Yeah, great. So the goldfish method is based on on the it's kind of like a, a... a thought experiment to say, if you if you had your mind erased after every move, and you were just looking at the board for the first time, like you would do, for example, with a new puzzle that you're seeing, then how do you assess what is going on on the board? Um, so, and and to to understand what the the imbalances are, strengths and weaknesses, and and so on. So what I do is I use the the arrows that you can get on Chess.com or also on Lee Chess to set out to illustrate on top of the board some some basic things. So I might draw an arrow for uh, every piece that is defended by another piece. Okay, And then I will highlight in red any piece that is undefended. Because if, for example, you see two pieces that are undefended, that might then show you the opportunity for a fork that you may not have noticed. Okay, um, But also pieces that are only defended once, for example. Or you might see, wow, that queen is the only defender of this piece and the only defender of this piece. Therefore, if I can deflect the queen away from one of those defensive duties, there may be an opportunity to to get something there. So, yeah, that was that was really it. And it's, it's really more for for beginners. But the the question's really good because you know, why do why do we forget the the principles um, that that we we know we know. Um, what makes us forget those? And quite honestly, I don't. I don't know the answer. But if we could solve that, then we'd all be higher rated than we are, right? Eh? Yeah, I. I think there's something um, evolutionary or biological at work. I mean, this is something that I am Willie Hendricks sort of gets at in uh, the book "Move First, Think Later," um, where we can try to slow ourselves down all we want, and we should. But the bottom line is when we look at a chest position, you know, when you're faced with a situation, you want to react, you know. Um, so th- I also think that that's why and, and this really struck me that you had come to this um, on your own or I assume on your own. I'll ask you about it in a second. But there's this uh, chess curriculum called the chest steps method. Regular listeners will have heard me discuss it a lot that it's by these Dutch educators and Dutch educator and a psychologist um, who uh try to teach you chess from scratch from zero to 2200 and there's like six different levels and tons of books um um, i'll put a few links for other resources in in the show description but one of the one of the things they teach when you're new to chess is what they call orientation which actually reminded me a lot of the way of the goldfish although i have to say ben way of the goldfish is way better name Um, but basically the idea is that each move you do try to reorient yourself and ask yourself questions like what are the unprotected pieces you know how is the king safety identify pieces with uh limited mobility you know as you look for pieces on the same line etc so just as you say as if each move as if you're sort of in a helicopter flying over the position and looking down and drilling down um so i am curious ben if like how you came to realize how important that is um uh it's it's just your blunders will we'll point that out to you when you analyze a game and, and you see, well, there's something really glaring here that I missed. Now, the, the definition of a mistake gets gets more and more refined and polished, of course, as, as you improve. But even spotting a hanging piece, for example, so I can if, if you take the time just to stop and identify, well, that piece is undefended and then you go, hey, wow, it's also under attack. Um, so. I mean that that that's really that's really it. I was I was trying to look into my own mind and see what is it that I that I do when I find a decent move, and the bottom line is you have to look at the entire board. So often, uh, uh, particularly beginners, but all the way through, we can we can get kind of tied up with looking at one area of the board that we think is the action area, and then 
how often do we miss, for example, a Fianchetto bishop that's, that's suddenly sitting there in its sniper's nest, you know, looking looking across the board, yeah. suddenly changed the game. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of uh, incorporating it, um, did you use any prompts to help you remind yourself to take this big picture view or was it just sort of repeat and hope for the best? It's, yeah, it's more hope for the best. So you, you, I think the general principle is this is to slow yourself right down. And if you can foot to force yourself to go through some kind of process and I've come up with like checklists as well over, over the year. Yeah. Um, but what you're really trying to do is you're trying to internalize it. For example, I've got, I've got an over the board game tonight and I'm not going to have any arrows. I mean, I've tried turning up for over the board games with a, a bunch of colored markers, but it's pretty frowned upon for you to start drawing <laughs> arrows on, on, on the board. Your opponent doesn't tend to like it. So that, that really is the goal is, is to internalize all of this stuff until it becomes a, a, an organic part of, of your process that when you can almost automatically spot the weaknesses, the underdefended pieces, the undefended pieces, and and the alignment issues and stuff like that. So it, it really is a, it's a discipline. There, it's it's like this thing. If you come across the principle of um, conscious and unconscious uh, proficiency, have you come across that? Right. You know, like when yeah, you're yeah, when you're fun, learning to drive. Learning, yeah. Yeah. When you're learning to drive, you are you are consciously incompetent. You 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 you're not good at driving, and you know you're not good at driving, and then then you move round this cycle until you become unconsciously competent at, at the other end of it, when you can you can drive well without without having to think about it. But yeah, I think it very much applies to chess as well. It does, although you know, even up to the twenty one hundred level, you still you don't you often don't feel that competent. I have to say, I mean, it, it's just. Uh, just such a challenging game. We will be back in one minute with more from Ben Hunt. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable is the leading chess education platform known for its proprietary move trainer technology, which uses space repetition to help you remember stuff. What kind of stuff? Well, tactical patterns, opening sequences. It can even help you drill specific end games. And of course, they have a huge library of courses to help you do that. They have courses both from prominent grandmasters like uh, Grandmaster Jordan von Forrest, Magnus Carlsen, Sam Shanklin, and they also have Great material for cl for club players, from club players. They have stuff for purchase, stuff you can check out for free. So be sure to go to chessable.com and check out what they have that is new. And we are back. Ben, you mentioned playing uh, over the board. Um, when did you get into that? Oh, man, I literally just started doing that the last few months. I, I Again, I just thought, oh, you know, I wonder if there's a... If there if there's a, a live club anywhere near me, just typed it in Chesterfield Chess Club in my nearest town, and uh, it popped up. And it happened to be only about three miles from where I live, so I, I went along there. But it's a, it's a world apart. It really is. I, after yeah. spending years playing in two D, when you can see the entire board in front of you in a glance, as long as as long as you're not, like we say, over focused on one particular action area of the board. But you know, a real challenge to go back to playing with um, atomic pieces rather than rather than just pixels. So it's definitely a huge challenge, but one that I really, really enjoy doing because you you really get to pick your wits against somebody, particularly at the club level, because I don't you don't know anything about them. You don't know if they're stronger right. than you, weaker than you, and that that's also a really good principle, I think, when you approach any game, because it's so tempting to go. I mean. <sighs> I mean, I, I've been bitten so many times by this when, for example, I, I want to make a video like I might get up one morning and think I'm not feeling too sharp today. I'm going to pull up an open challenge against somebody like 300 points lower rated, and I'm going to try and use it as a, a good training video and point out their errors. Um, but because I've decided that they are a weaker player, then that can I can really trip over my own feet doing that because... I'm, I'm looking for their mistakes and, and fail to spot my own, the errors in my own thinking and fail to defend properly and defend my position. And I've, lo I've lost 15, 16 points before playing much lower rated players who, um, who really dig their heels in and decide I'm playing somebody 300 points stronger. And they're only risking one 
or two rating points if they lose. But they they really dig in, and because they're not talking on camera as well, I guess it also helps slightly. But uh, th there is right. actually um, <laughs> there's there's a, a browser plugin that you can get for Chess.com that will hide your opponent's rating when you start a game as well. But yeah, I don't I don't play with that now. You can also go into Zen mode on Chess.com, and that will hide it as well. But but to be able to approach yeah, I know that every player the same, say I okay, I'm a, I'm I'm now playing somebody who is. You should assume that they are stronger than you are. You should assume that they are in a better state of mind than you are, that they're more determined than you are. So you really should knuckle down and dig in. And and when I think when I play my best, it's when I approach every game as though, and I, I, I say to myself, okay, I am willing to do whatever it takes to get the 1-0 out of this game. You know, if it comes down to, a one pawn advantage in the ending that I'm going to grind it out and I'm not going to give my opponent any chance in this game. The, 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 the times when I really, really dump rating points is when I do what, what gamblers call chasing losses. You know, when, when you, you have a loss yep. and you, you get angry about it and you think I shouldn't have done that or my opponent punked me in that, in that game and that you just hit new game out of frustration and then you're trying to, you're trying to win the game and, and get the rating points back in one fifth of the time that you have available. That's a really, really dangerous time to play. We've all been there. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it mainly crops up in bullet, but, um, I don't but, play uh, I'm it's 50 it's years dangerous. old. I, I, I can't, I can't play <laughs> that right now. Good for you. Yeah. I, I'm a semi retired as well, but, but, <laughs> but every time I do play, I end up going down those, those same psychological patterns from like my teens and twenties pop up. So it's a reminder not to play. Um, but so let me ask you, Ben, with on a follow up on the tournament. So you mentioned that you don't know their ratings here in the U S you it's, it would be kind of hard to avoid finding out the rating of your opponents. Although you might be able to do it in the, the big tournament company continental chess sends you a text uh mm -hmm. with your pairing so and i it often doesn't include the rating so i guess if you just did that and didn't look at the wall charts where the list the pairings are listed you might be able to but is not everyone rated uh within the uh english federation yeah yeah they they are for sure um but in club play that's not advertised so like, for example, I'm going along to a community center tonight. We're going to have maybe six boards. I'm going to sit at a board. There's going to be a player opposite me I've probably never seen in my life. And there's no there's no listing. They're, they're supposed to arrange the boards in order of their current ECF rating. But but that's it. But I, I find that refreshing. And if I'm sitting against somebody who's who's maybe an 1800, I, I want to sit down and think, I've got a shot against this this guy. Or if, if there are, I mean, I've, I've lost against lower, lower rated players as well by uh, overestimating my abilities. But yeah, I, I, I kind of like that. I, I like having it, doing it blind. Yeah, I agree. Although in a lot of communities, Ben, since you're relatively new to, to over the board, I think you'll start mm -hmm. to see a lot of familiar faces and develop personal histories with a lot of these yeah. people. I have, I, I've played one player twice only so far, and I lost to him in the first game. Uh, he played the Vienna against me, and I, uh, I, I've been a Vienna player for a few years, and I absolutely detest playing against it. I don't know why that particular opening is my Achilles heel, but uh, I'm, I'm constantly looking for unusual and quirky ways to knock my opponents out of their preparation as, as soon as possible, which, which I think probably works better at the intermediate level, getting up to the expert level it becomes more dangerous if you if you pick unsound approaches but uh, that's definitely it's it's part of my style it's it's what i enjoy doing okay yeah it'll be interesting to see how it develops and i think the vienna is going to gain in in popularity um when i interviewed the correspondents world champion john edwards he mentioned it in sort of even the elite computer level you know we're talking 3500 level chess um because it's a fixed structure and pawns don't get traded early it sort of uh, allows more scope for maneuvering which obviously at the club level that's kind of irrelevant but i think what is relevant at the the club level is that as you say it's uh relatively unexplored and if you catch your opponent um off guard you can get like some you know nice attacking positions um do you see it a lot at your at your level ben 
Yeah, I, I've, I found the Vienna a lot. And I, I think also um, Levy Rosman is, is pushing the Vienna. Alex Banzer is pushing the Vienna. I think Naroditsky is promoting ah, okay. it as well. So I, I think it's gaining in popularity as well. Um, a few months ago, I, I and actually, there's, there's an interesting thing here. I don't want to get too caught up talking about openings because I think in particularly in terms of the products that are out there on the market, it seems to be 95% about openings. All the, all the emails I get in my inbox is from Chessable and, and all, these, all these different brands. They're all saying, oh, here's an opening that, that you need to memorize to crush 1D4. Here's an opening that you know, will win every time with, with white. And it's like, oh, come on, seriously, guys. But for the, for the majority, for, for me, talking to beginners and improvers, I don't, I don't think that's, that's really the way to go. So I, I, I set myself a challenge a few months ago. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step up and strap a pair on and uh, trade my Vienna opening for an immediate King's Gambit. Um, but oh, I, wow. I, I didn't have the guts. I didn't have the guts to see that one through. I was, I was getting good results with the Vienna. But uh, yeah, I've also gone back to one of my first loves as well, which is the Danish Gambit as well. I, I really do enjoy that kind of, that kind of play. Nice. Yeah. I mean, and to your point, I mean, first of all, we should say Chessable is a sponsor uh, of the pod, but, but I agree that, that uh, club players, I mean, there's been an evolution on this podcast of how I think about it as I've been doing this for six years, but um, it, uh, openings to me are not irrelevant, but they are overemphasized. But in terms of like how much they're pitched, I think there's like a chicken and egg issue because even before there were digital courses, it was chess opening books that sold the most. There's like a human interest in openings that uh, causes more products to be created, and then it sort of creates a cycle. Um, but Ben, I'm we'll talk about your your chess forum later, and even in checking out your forum, I noticed that there's a lot of discussion about openings. So it's like I agree with you that they don't play as big a role as um as a lot of people think or people at least study them um more than they should if they're trying to sort of optimize their chess but on the other hand i i'm i think it's kind of like a part of human nature do you do you think this can be changed i i mean let's maybe kind of pare it down a bit then because i i think maybe it's not it's not openings as such but theory i think maybe theory okay. is far yeah. less useful for a beginner um and even if you devote some a few hours to to trying to memorize some theory for a particular opening, um, you it can kind of trick you into thinking that you've got an advantage going, you know, into the middle game if you think that an opening has gone your way, and that can sometimes prompt you to come off the gas a little bit and to ease up and think that the the game's going to win itself, which very often doesn't happen. In my experience. And when I look at, I, I'm 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 a fan of the of Chess.com's review feature now. And when you get the graph of the advantage, the line graph that goes throughout the game, there are very few games at my level, at the intermediate level, that are one in the opening. But even at other levels mm -hmm. as well, you know, um, <clears throat> and, unless you get a nine move mate, which which is which is always nice to do, but for me. It, it very often comes down to tactics in the middle game and also end game fundamentals are far, far too few beginners and improving players take any time to study end games. And you can end up getting a draw from a game that you should clearly have won, or you can lose a game that you, where you should have been able to rescue a draw. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I, to be clear, I think, it, I think it's, it's trying to memorize too much theory can actually be be counterproductive. I, th I think that 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 the the, the majority, the ninety five percent of players, would be far better off studying tactics and studying end game principles rather than uh, any theory at all. To be honest. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I know that Chessable is is increasingly offering like Andres Toth has more beginner oriented opening courses, and I know they're making it a big point of emphasis. And uh, we've talked; it's come up a lot on the pod, Ben, about uh, the importance of um, trying to understand ideas of openings rather than um, memorizing theory. But uh, but I want to follow up on the end game point um, because you hear a wide range of um, different approaches to end games. So um, how, how have you approached them, Ben? What have you done to try to improve in them? 
<laughs> well, um, one of my co- one of my coaches said that I should get Varetsky's Endgame manual, which I have purchased. Oh my god! I, Say it ain't so. <laughs> I've read the first read the okay. first four pages. If I ever want to go to sleep one night and I'm having stru- trouble sleeping, then right. pick, picking up Varetsky is is a great way to do that. Because it's really really hard to do on on paper when you don't have a physical board in front of you to make the moves on. Really tough. So what I've actually started doing is working through the manual and converting it into Lee Chess studies. I think Lee Chess's study feature is absolutely wonderful, one of the best tools we have out there. And to, to think that it's free as well, I think, is is great. On, on Just looping back, though, to the point on opening on openings, um, I'm a big fan of Chessable's short and sweet versions as well. I, I love the fact that they yeah, give yeah. So I've been working through uh, Simon Williams' British Grand Prix. Uh, and, and for me, at my level, the short and sweet version is absolutely all I need. You know, getting up to 1900, 2000, I, w- I would, and if, if I stick to, if I stick with that opening um, up to 1900, 2000, then I, w- I would go ahead and purchase the full course because that will give you more insight into it. But I, I, I have wasted money on, on books and I've wasted money on courses over the time for sure. But I, th- I think the yeah. thing about openings is um, r- rather than the rather than the, the theory is to, to get a feel for the style or the character or the flavor of an opening. So this this tends to lead to games that I like. For example, it generally puts a smile on my face. Well, I don't know. It's kind of double-edged. But when somebody plays the King's Gambit against me, I, I'm usually feeling, oh, I'm going to enjoy this game. However it goes, I'm going to enjoy it because my opponent is romantically inclined and they they clearly like the tactics. So let's get stuck into that. Whereas whereas the people who start with like a yeah. double Bishop Fianchetto and, and some of these hyper-modern openings, um, I know I'm going to have to be a, a lot more cagey. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, the yeah the the King's Gambit is is fun if if nothing else. Um, on the end game thing, I have to say, I've, I, it pains me to hear you re- recommended the Divretsky end game manual. It's a, I, I've, it's funny. I'm working on a book, Ben, about sort of the the compiled advice from the podcast, and I have like a couple pages on the Divretsky manual because it's come up so often on the podcast. And in my and some other coaches' opinions, it's like misrecommended so often, not because it's not a fantastic book. But because, in my humble opinion, Ben, like someone rated fifteen hundred, there's they should not be reading it. You know, I completely <laughs> like, agree. I completely have you read? Uh, <laughs> okay, have you read uh, Silman's Endgame Course? No, I I haven't done Silman's. No, I haven't done that one. Yeah. Okay, but, that that is a much better recommendation. Um, I I would say you're you're close to the edge, like definitely below your level it's fantastic i would say it goes up to like 16 to 1800 mm-hmm. uh feet a slash uscf so you're you're close to air quotes graduating out of it but that's better and 100 end games you must know is is challenging like the the name is very simple but even that is is easier than uh divaretsky's end game manual so it <laughs> kind of made me cringe when when <laughs> i heard it recommended although you know shout out to the legend it's good to support divaretsky's uh family <laughs> Yeah, for sure. By for buying sure. the course. Look, it's it's there. It's on my bookshelf. It's not going to rot anytime soon. Hopefully, I'll be able to get around to studying it if I can improve enough before it okay. does rot away. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and I think a lot of people look at it that way. Like, you know, I'll need this sooner or later. But I'm not even sure if that's true for a lot of amateurs. Um, okay, we've got another Patreon question that I've been meaning to get to. So this one is from Matt Elliott. Thanks for supporting the pod, Matt. And he says, um, my chess improvement efforts include nearly daily tactics practice using a tactics trainer, lots of YouTube videos, a weekly Zoom class, some chess.com lessons, and a few chessable courses. And he says his chess knowledge is broader and deeper than when he was younger, um, when he had a rating in the 1100s, but his tournament performances disappoint. He seems stuck in the 900s. So he asks you, Ben, uh, what are one or two things you suggest to help folks increase their ratings when they've been stuck in the 800s to 1000s for an extended time? Are there mistakes in their approach to studying that you see common to folks in this range? Wow, it's a big question. Uh, Obviously, I I deal with quite a few uh, people under the 1000 level, and uh, I have actually given lessons as well. Sometimes I get some grief 
in my YouTube comments, people saying, who the hell are you? are not a grandmaster. How, how can you give lessons? Right. <laughs> I'm like, well, look, <laughs> if, if you want to, if you want to learn to play tennis and your, your cousin has played a bit of tennis, you know, and joined the school team, then they can take you down to the local court and show you how to swing a racket and do a forehand and a backhand. That's all, that's all I'm doing. So I, I'll give lessons to people up to like 1100 rated where it's not that I'm at the destination. I'm not, I'm not at the top of the mountain, but I'm, Hey, I'm far enough ahead on, on the, on the road in front of them to be able to guide them on their next steps, which is, which is all it's about. So yeah, someone 800 to uh, eight, 900. Well, well, you could think about that. Cause I have, I have something to add, Ben, that I think is yeah. important, which the fact that you're recommended, I don't want to, you know, I'm sure your coach provides some great services in some other respects, but the fact that you're recommended Dvoretsky's end game manual, like that shows why it's important or it can be very valuable to have someone who learned chess, like um, improved at chess as an adult and actually understands and is able to communicate like this is what worked for me because, um, you know, all due respect to grandmasters. I mean, they're basically geniuses, but that's like a blessing and a curse because they yeah. were like, uh, you know, they were basically born 1200, you know, um, in a lot of cases, if not higher. So, um, so to me, it, it absolutely makes sense to get um, someone as a as a coach who's a rung or two up on the ladder, not necessarily um, like um, an, an IM or a GM. But um, so, I just yeah. wanted to throw that in. You feel free to respond or to circle back to uh, to Matt's yeah. question. Well, that that coach was uh, is a U.S. national master, uh, but I won't mention names. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's such a common question. Probably the number one thing, and, and I struggle with this as well, if you're talking about, about live play over the board or tournament play, is slow the heck down. Number, number one. Um, you know, people say, oh, I'm struggling to get a, above 1,000 in Blitz. I'm saying, well, don't play Blitz. Just stop it. Play. My recommendation is, is to play 15 plus 10 if you, if you really want to improve at, at, at the slowest, really. If you want to improve above 4,000, play 15 plus 10 and give yourself the time and also use the time. I think so many games that we play are, are thrown away because you just snatch at something. You're like, like a child, who, you put candy in front of them and they just grab it and stick it in their mouth. Right? We, and uh, I had a game like this just the other day. I was playing against somebody about 300 points lower rated. I made a great video. It's really instructional. I was kind of three pawns up coming into the into the ending i think i might have had an, a, an additional piece and um my opponent just captured a pawn with his rook i'm like well that was silly so i re immediately recaptured stalemate his king had no squares right. and i don't know if he saw it i don't know what went on but and it was it was that that was the quickest move that i made in the entire game like 1.2 seconds and that was it, the end of the game, you know? So simply, like literally sitting on your hands is, is a good one until, until you've gone through this process. Okay, have I, have I understood the board? Have I looked at my opponent's last move? Have I answered to my own satisfaction why my opponent made that move? Have I explained to myself thoroughly what has changed on the board with my opponent's last move? Have I considered multiple candidate moves? And if you possibly can, add one. Add one to consider that you didn't originally consider because the natural moves are very often not, not necessarily the best. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. And then am I completely happy with my selected move? Sanity check it. And this is, this is a great thing that you can do online where I love to pick up, pick up the piece and drag it with my mouse and hover over the square where I want to drop it. And just look again. If I do this, what's going to happen? Now, you can't do that over the board either, but at least online, uh, that can really help. But yeah, I, th I think number one, number one is just slowing down. So then give yourself time to go through whatever, go through what your, your current understanding of, of the game um, to an exhaustive level before you select your next move. Good advice. Now, I know Matt a little bit. I know he's um, in the general area of our age. Um, I, so 
and my experience has been people uh, around our age, Ben, they're less inclined to move fast. I find that to be often a young person problem. So do you, if there's, if there's another issue at play, let's say Matt says that he does play s- slow and that that's not the issue. Can you think of any other advice, anything you see among the 800 to a thousand range that, um, that often crops up? I, th- I, I would say it's, it's, it will often come down to process, you know? Um, mm-hmm. and, in, and it's literally if this, then that. I, th- I think a massive thing in chess is this kind of uh, calculation fatigue that we get, where we go, okay, well, I okay, if I make move A, what is my opponent likely to do? I don't know. He might go there or, or whatever. You know, can I can I see a danger? And then you, then there comes the, this point where we all go, oh, I can't do any more. I can't think any more about this position. I'm just going to make the move and, and then see what happens. And I think puzzles can really, really help with that because puzzles will force you to to think through a position um, a lot more. Um, but I think, you know, again, just going back to what we said before, the 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 end game fundamentals is is really good because this kind of goes back to like the Soviet school as well, where they, as I understand it, the Soviets would get young young boys. On, on the whole, and they they started with end games. They started with this is a winning end game, and this is how you win it. This is a drawn end game, and this is how you make sure it's a draw. And then you can move back backwards from the end game into the middle game, so that they're understanding how do I achieve a winning end game position from the middle game, and then they do the openings. Whereas a lot of us yeah. think it far far too much from the start of the game towards the end, whereas they used to teach it backwards. Um, good advice. Yeah. Now, Ben, let me ask you. Um, so you've mentioned a lot of your favorite YouTube creators, um, a few books that may or may not be gathering some dust, which, again, <laughs> we can all relate to. Um, what's your tactics work been like? Is that a big part of your regimen or is it more you learn the tactics through the games that you play? Oh, it absolutely is. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a secret product, right? Or maybe a product. I don't know. So I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we've got a We've got it. We've we've set up kind of an online club called Chess Bootcamp Live, yeah. uh, which you can see at chessbootcamp.club. And what what we do there is we we get together for for two hour live sessions. Okay, so everyone jumps on Zoom. We'll very often do a bot game, or we'll review uh, members' own games from during the week, or do a Q and A stuff like that. Uh, and we've got we've got three coaches so there's there's me i've got james who's 1900 rated rapid and craig who's 2100 rapid um when when craig started <clears throat> so I'll just loop, loop back a little bit of history so we've been doing this about 18 months now um when when craig started his sessions back last year the first eight weeks he spent on endgame fundamentals interestingly and and quite honestly those sessions were the most instructive and useful study that I think I've ever done in chess to do it live. And I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of studying live. Um, so, yeah, to answer your question, what I'm doing right now is um, I'm, I'm actually gathering and putting together some lead chess studies which are themed on particular tactics. So I'm assuming you've, you've come across the woodpecker method before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, but the Woodpecker method was created really for title players who are studying for like GM norms and and stuff like that, really to to get, to to, like time your training ready for the Olympics kind of of level. But the idea is that, so if anyone doesn't know about it, then they've got these sets of, I think, 250 positions that you have to solve and they've all come directly from the games of, of previous chess world champions. And there's like an easier, medium, and then harder set. And you have to, tr- you have to, you go through the set and through it and through it and through it. And it might take you a month to, to complete the set and to get all the problems answered correctly at first. And then, then you, you, you repeat, you go right back to the beginning, you do the whole thing again and again until you can solve the entire set in a single 24 hour block. And then you move on to the the next set, right? So I thought that's great, and I've had a few people recommend that to me over 
o- over the the years in comments. But it got me thinking because, uh, and I purchased that. I purchased you can get it um, as a Chessable course as well. So I purchased that from Chessable. Um, but it got me thinking. Well, this is really aimed at, at the expert and titled level. Would the same kind of approach work for the beginner and improving player? So I'm now creating. Um, so I've got entire uh, leecher studies for Night Forks Easy, Night Forks Medium, Night Forks Hard. I'm trying to build up a set of maybe 30 to 50 problems in each of those that you can you can hit in in the the leecher study and go over it and time yourself and record record your timings and to try and improve that way because so much of it is simply pattern recognition. And I, I think that kind of repetition could could work out to be really useful. So that that's something that I'm doing. So now, when I when I finish a game, it might even be a five minute blitz game. I'll go over it, and I'll learn not just from the cool things that I found, or the cool things that my opponent found, but also from the analysis. The engine recommendation might say, "Dude, you missed something spectacular here," and there's a really clever move. So I'll, I'll grab it. I'll grab grab the fen from it I'll, I'll i'll select the right study for it to go into and i've got about 50 of these different studies for like removing the defender deflection you know all all the all the uh, the, the main tactics and I'll, I'll put it in there and add my notes as well so that when somebody comes along to this they can just start it and it will actually teach you to a degree it'll help you guide you through understanding the tactics as well so that that's something i'm not really training that right now but I'm hoping that that when I've got that all fleshed out, it will become very, very useful, and that that will just be made available to our our chess bootcamp club guys. Like, um, and we, we've been through that in like some of those in in some of our training sessions as well, and it, it has proved to be quite interesting. And but also to use like the wisdom of the crowd. So I'm going to get a bunch of people testing it out for me and to say actually this one this one's clunky, this one's not right, or this one, the engine's actually got a better, there's a better move there than the one that you've suggested. So we can scrap those ones and improve it, evolve it over time. I, I know I don't do cool, enough. It sounds- I, I know I should do more more puzzle rush as well, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a slightly different muscle set than the the slower puzzles. But yeah, I think both are, mm. are good, especially for us well, middle-aged I, guys. Um, I, only, I only do puzzle rush survival. I don't do the time draw. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's good too because it's a little. It feels a little more high stakes, and especially for tournament players, as as you're uh, becoming. Uh, just a quick follow up on the woodpecker method for for anyone who hasn't heard it. A couple years back, I did a whole podcast about it with uh, Neil Bruce, and you can get a lot of info, a lot of context about it. But but Ben, yeah, I um, so I'll, I'll link to that. But Ben, I definitely agree woodpecker method it's not uh over recommended to newer players as egregiously as uh divoretsky's endgame manual but (laughs) but it it is the especially the intermediate and the advanced sections are are quite challenging and even the the beginner i would say the easier uh, not beginner section i think is like 1500 level or something you would probably be able to to say better than me um so it sounds like a, a worthy project that that you're working on yeah, well, hopefully I'll be able to come back to you in six months and uh, tell you if it works. So I'm calling mine's called uh-huh, the Woody yeah. Woodpecker method. So it's like a it's a cartoon version of the full one. <laughs> nice. We will be back in one minute with more from Ben Hunt. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by AimChess.com. AimChess has an algorithm that gathers your games from the major chess playing sites like Chess.com and Lee Chess and then gives you actionable intel on how to improve your game. It evaluates different phases of the game, tells you how you're doing with certain openings, and they're constantly rolling out new features to make Aim Chess even better. Some of the new ones include a blunder preventer drill that you can do, and they've now got blindfold exercises where you can work on your chess visualization skills. So be sure to check out Aim Chess if you have not already. And if you decide to subscribe, then use the code PERPETUAL30 to save 30%. You can also click on the link in the show description to aimchess.com. And we are back. 
So, so Ben, let's talk, you know, of course your, your YouTube channel and your chess.com forum have come up a little bit, um, in the conversation, but I am curious as a fellow content creator, like what were the origins? I did go back to watch your first video three, three years ago. Um, but what was the, uh, original impetus for starting to make YouTube videos? And, uh, I'm just curious how, how you view sort of the evolution of the community you're building. Wow. Um, to be honest, I, I can't even remember why I made the first video. But I mean, I, I've always been, I, I started out as a web designer in 1994. So this is a pre-Netscape browser, which all really shows my age. Uh, we were designing on Mosaic back then. So I've, I've always been in tech and very comfortable with computers. So I've uh, made a bunch of videos over the past. I've, I've created courses online. So I'm quite comfortable with video editing and all of that stuff. And it just seemed to be a natural thing for me to do when I when I had a game that thought I thought, well, this is really useful. This this could really help somebody. So, yeah, <clears throat> I'm sure my my first videos were super clunky um, compared to the uh, slightly more sophisticated version that you'll that you'll see today. But I'm really really enjoying it. Another thing that I've added recently as well is I've started doing shorts on YouTube. Because somebody recommended it in in a comment on one of my videos to say, have you looked into YouTube Shorts? So. YouTube Shorts is a, it's like YouTube's answer to TikTok and Instagram Reels, where videos have to be, they A, they have to be in phone format, so they're in tall, tall format, and also they have to be less than 60 seconds in length. And I thought, oh, wow. Yeah, well, how can you do anything useful in chess in less than 60 seconds? Well, well, you can. So what I've been doing is I've been taking those examples from my, you know, from my Woody, um, studies when, when I come across an interesting position and I'll, I'll, I'll very often I'll add it to my, to my Woody study, but then I'll also make a short out of it. So, so it'll go, here's a position, your opponent plays this move. What do you do? Pause and find out. And then you can hit pause on, on the short video and then I'll, I'll simply give you the solution. And that's working incredibly well. It, it like tripled my, um, I mean, Actually, uh, YouTube traffic and, and the, there's been this massive recent surge in chess interest that's even eclipsed the, the Queen's Gambit lockdown surge that, that we experienced. Uh, from the end of last year, October, November, December, it's, it's gone crazy. And yeah, chess.com started falling over and, and, and coughing and wheezing and Levy's made, <laughs> made a video about it. But yeah, my traffic, my traffic on, the, on the website, on, on the channel has definitely gone up. And I, I recently hit 10,000 subscribers which I thought was wonderful until I saw a Gotham chess video where he shared his stats and he got 10,000 <laughs> subscribers in one day. I'm like, Levy, dude, I've been, I've been doing this for three years and you get it in one day. How very dare you. But, um, it's amazing. 3 million subs now. <laughs> Shout out to Levy. Oh, wow. um, but he did, I'll give Levy credit. He paid his dues. I mean, I, I interviewed him when, when he had 10,000 subs and he was just grinding every day. So he didn't pay yeah. his dues for decades or anything, but, but he had his, his lean year or so. <laughs> but but the, the, the YouTube shorts seem, seem really, really popular. And it's also my subscriber count has, has gone up from that. Not only the views, but the subscribers has gone up as well. Cause there's people, you know, sitting there on a toilet break at work and, and they don't want to sit and watch a, a 30 minute rapid game where I'm explaining every move through, but people love that as well. I think that there's some, do you know, there is a huge lack of, um, of intermediate long format chess on, on YouTube. There's so much of it is, is, is on there from, from title players and very often just streaming what, what they like to do, which is, like blitz tournaments, like Title Tuesday and stuff like that, it's it's all interesting, but they haven't got time to explain the thought process. So all I'm watching is a a virtuoso performance. I'm I'm not I'm not actually improving by watching it. Um, yeah, and there there are like like we said, there are there are a few who who have that ability to be not only a great practitioner but a a, a great teacher as well. I think Daniel is is. Uh, is really exceptional and I was really glad to find him about a year ago. Yeah, and so so is uh John Bartholomew who you also mentioned does a yeah. does an amazing job. Um all right, we got a couple more listener questions to get through Ben. This has been awesome. Um 
from Igor Feinstein, who saw a lot of similarities in his chess upbringing. Um, but uh, we covered some of what he asked. But the main question I wanted to ask from what Igor wrote is, what are your chess goals for the next five years? Wow. Um, I think really my only chess goal would be to to get to 2000 on chess.com rapid, I think is the, you know, I think that would be absolutely amazing. And I, and I know it's doable. Like my, my fellow uh, trainer, James, he's, he's been, he's only been playing chess for a couple of years, really. And he's, he's shot up from 1000 to 1900. So he'll be knocking on 2000 uh, very soon. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I, how I do, how I, old is James? James is probably less than 30. So yeah. Okay. I don't know for sure. I'm curious because uh, what I've noticed in doing this podcast is you do hear stories about like that. Um, and of course, I've interviewed people like that under the age of 30. But the the older you get, the more rare those stories become, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know whether it's possible to hit 2000 over 50. But uh, the information's out there. I, th I think I'm, I'm smart enough to do it. It's it's more a question of discipline. But I, I, I certainly can't afford to be studying several hours a day to get there but the bottom line for me is it's a game i want to enjoy it i it, you, you know, we we play chess it's 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 you know i i i don't know what it's like for for somebody who's who's a, who's a professional who does this for their job um it, it makes me think about you know like people who who have a a wine tasting channel or or they're on tv doing wine tasting I, I do sometimes find my, myself wondering, <clears throat> do they enjoy drinking wine as much as somebody who buys wine to enjoy it without getting too analytical about it? So, I mean, you know, for, for you yourself, do you, do you enjoy the game in the same way that you did before you were a title player? I'm interviewing you now. Uh, yeah, I, I do, actually. I mean, but for me, you have to step away from the improvement. Like, I've had a lot going on on the work and family front, and actually, to be honest, pretty stressed the past week. And when when you get in that mindset, actually, one of the things that does help relax me is to play a few blitz games online, not necessarily hoping to um, win or lose, but just because it's so enveloping that to me, it's like this mm. great escape, you know, it's like whatever it is that you can't get out of this sort of uh, thought loop in your head, you sit down to play chess and it goes away. So in that respect, um, I, I will always enjoy chess. And that's something that's been true for me. There were there were years where I wasn't working in chess. And even then, if I had a bad day, I, in those days, it was more likely to be bullet. But I might sit down and play a bullet session, and I might hate myself at the end of that bullet session if it's like I'm going to bed super late or something like that. But yeah. during that time, I'm engrossed, and I'm not stressed about what I sat down um, to think about. But, of course, when you do make your living from chess, there does there that's not to say that there can't be some burnout. I mean, there can't. Of course, there's going to be times where... Um, you know, you're you're less excited to do whatever it is you have to do than other times. But the last thing I would say is, you know, I'm uh, as as weak as they come in terms of titled players. Um, um, as a, a USCF master who's been losing rating points, um, but um, so to me, what would really be stressful is the actual professionals who actually need to win in order to bring money home, and even just to compete at that level. Like I, that's why. I'm, I'm always in such awe of these great players when I interview them because um, they're all so incredible at the game. And that, to me, um, that that would be stressful. Yeah, but it, it must take a certain type of personality to be able to make the sacrifices that you have to do in order to get to that level. Um, I, I think for, for the rest of us, the most it's really, really important not to forget to enjoy yourself when you're playing. And... The thing, and also try to, try to get to a point where you enjoy the study as well. So if you don't enjoy this something, why do it? All right, so go through a game with with anticipation when it's over, even if you've lost. Go through it with with um, excitement to say, okay, I I don't. Want, it's not necessarily about finding out where did I screw up, but what did I miss? What 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 
areas of improvement are there in, in my thinking process about the game that, that, I can, that I can take from this? And if you don't enjoy that process, then you're very unlikely to improve. I think the, the, the slowest way to improve is just to keep hitting new five minute, new five minute every time. Yeah, well said, for sure. Um, yeah, but it's nice how chess can, it can fulfill different roles. I mean, if you are just hitting new five minute, it can take you away from other problems. It won't help your chess, but sure. it still does fulfill some function. Whereas and, if you're and, in a and, different and, frame and, of mind. Yeah. Sorry, and then at the same time, don't necessarily put a burden on yourself that, that you have to be improving. Right. And I, 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 I have people on my, on my channel who leave a comment saying, oh man, I dropped down from 500 to 400 and I'm not going to play again for, I'm going to take a month off. I'm, I'm just too pissed. You know, I, I, I don't, not enjoying this. You know, so, well, it's only a number, man. It really is only a yeah. number. You know, enjoy, either enjoy playing chess or don't enjoy playing it, but don't let, don't let the number spoil your, spoil your enjoyment of, of, of the game. It's meant to be fun. Yeah, it really is. It really is the number that <laughs> that that throws people off. If it if there were no ratings, I think I don't think I think people's approach would be entirely different, um, and probably healthier. But it's hard to get away from them. Um, so uh, one more listener question. This one's kind of in the weeds from a fellow uh, chess educator. This is from supporter of the pod, uh, David Lazarus. Thanks for supporting the pod as always, David. Um, and he asks. He says. Um, when you're teaching a position from a tactical puzzle, how important is it to show the buildup to the tactic? And since you've been working on your uh, Woody Woodpecker method, I'm sure you've been thinking about this sort of thing. Oh, uh, <clears throat> that, that's, that's a really rich question, actually. And I honestly, I don't, don't really know how to answer it. But the, the, I think the idea with tactics, it's, it's almost like the opposite end of it is, is the goldfish method, where you don't know how we got here because I only have a memory of seven seconds. And so I'm seeing this position as though it's for the first time. Um, do I see the pattern? And the, when, you, when you see the pattern, and when a pattern has become ingrained in your mind, then you can start to lead up to it in, in, in the preceding moves. But um, yeah, first and foremost, this is the, the pattern recognition uh, has to be there. There are sometimes when when I'm I don't know when when I'm just playing well and I'm playing really fluently. Positions, good positions, seem to grow themselves. It's really weird how, how it happens. So sometimes I think I'm 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 strong today. I'm doing all right today, and you know I I I, I fall flat on my face even against weaker players. Sometimes it seems like they're playing really well. And then other times I could just be playing with ease, and they seem to fall apart game after game after game. So one of the things that really, really fascinates me about chess is not only the game itself, but also the the insight that it gives me into my own level of mental performance. So um, how recently I've eaten, how well I've slept, have I had any caffeine or, or anything like that? It's, it's really fascinating. So I'm, I'm very, very interested myself. And I talk about this on my channel as well. I talk about the kind of biohacking side of it, just to, uh, to say, well, mm -hmm. how can you mentally prepare yourself to be good beyond purely the technical knowledge of the game. So I, I find that really, really interesting. I know a, chos, a, a lot of um, content creators out there seem to be really, really hooked on their coffee, <laughs> their energy drinks and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm certainly a coffee enthusiast. And yeah, I uh, have to time it carefully when I play tournaments when, it, when it's uh, most important. Um, well, Ben, uh, this has been amazing. Uh, the only sort of broad topic I wanted to, to hit on before uh, we say our goodbyes is just a little bit more about your life away from the chessboard, because you did send me a fascinating email um, about sort of your wide range of interests, uh, like a lot of chess enthusiasts. It sounds like you've got a bit of an obsessive streak. Um, mm -hmm. But let, let's start with this question, Ben. So you mentioned you don't have unlimited time to study chess. Like, what else is taking up your time uh, right now? Yeah, well, Outside I mean, I chess. Yeah, I've, I've written written a bunch of books over the years. Like I say, I came from an internet or well, web design and internet marketing background. Um, but my my recent thing is is more in that biohacking area. Actually, I've I've teamed up with with a buddy of mine, and we're we're running a a a ninety day challenge to do with uh, biohacking with in particular diet. It's called it's called the Big Fat Challenge. We're, we're trying to. Hmm 
to get people to to rediscover the the health benefits of of meat and animal fats in particular uh, to try and counter the epidemic in obesity and chronic disease that that's engulfing really really engulfing the the west right now um mm -hmm. so yeah that that's that's really taking up the vast majority of my time right now we've, we've got a, a group running on that so that's that's been absolutely fascinating my, my um because I, I actually i actually came to it i was i've always been fascinated with how humans should live and how can we be healthy and happy and fulfilled on the earth so that that has taken me down all kinds of rabbit holes over the years i i used to be mad keen in permaculture i designed and built my own greenhouse i grew my own vegetables and stuff and i've also got like a homestead here so we, we keep ducks and chickens as well for the eggs um but yeah I, I i took myself to a load of uh regenerative farming conferences and uh and found uh the importance the importance of, of of animals in the food chain and and our place in the food chain as well so yeah i'm a kind of a philosopher on on those levels as well you might be able to see in the background i also also make didgeridoos which is <laughs> bizarre right. as well. the uh like a version of the australian aboriginal instrument but yeah i mean ch chess chess is one of those constants in my day though it's very 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 rare a day goes by where i don't make at least one video or play play a handful of games um it, it really does uh it satisfies on on so many levels and it, the challenge is is always there and I'm, I'm somebody who just needs a challenge every single day so that's great well well i enjoyed checking out your content again for listeners the, the there's a chess.com forum chess boot camp the youtube channel is called chess boot camp um and i will have one more question for you but before we get to it ben what is there any other um any anywhere else our listeners should check for your content no that's that's pretty much it yeah you can go to chess boot camp uh, on youtube or check out chessbootcamp.club if you, if you fancy training training live with in in a social setting with a group of people because uh, online play is really great and you can have clubs and and bulletin boards and stuff like that online but uh getting together with with a bunch of other players around your own rating uh, it, it's like the kind of the coffee shop feeling, you know, or, or being able to turn right. up to a club and, and playing with other people in real life. And we can't all do that. But one of one of I mean, the Internet has really, really done chess a huge favor. Being able to play with other people online is is wonderful. Unfortunately, you, you have to you have to accept the, the very real fact that there's quite a lot of cheating goes on. I I, I would hope that that. That diminishes the the uh, higher up the the skill level that you get. I, I think it does. Um, but yeah, another way that the internet can help us really well is to is to have communities and to to meet together in a live setting as well, like you and I are now, even though there's a whole ocean between us. So yeah, yeah that's exactly. something that, that yeah. we all enjoy doing. Excellent. Well, Ben, as I tease my last question for you, um, because again, your your community is especially geared, I think, for people. Um, say, is it? Would you say up to twelve hundred or a bit higher? What What's the rating guideline? Yeah, I, I have people up to up to fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred. I've, I've got I've got some regular commenters that are up towards the two thousand level who who like to offer me some free coaching as well. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's okay. quite a unique channel in that you're not you're not you're not watching an expert player by any means and that I quite often I'll something will happen and I'll, I'll say, yeah, I'm sure there are people like spitting their crispies at their screen over their breakfast. <laughs> thing that's going, you, you absolute dummy. You missed that, you know, that sitting blunder there, but Hey, Hey, you know, that, that that's what you get. I drop my pants on a regular basis on my channel, but I, w <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. It's, it's all I can do. I try and make it entertaining. You've got, You've got a good attitude about it, and I'm sure you're you're helping people. So, in closing, Ben, let's say there for listeners who are who want to get to 1,200 and aren't there yet, what would be your final three, your top three tips? Let's do a listicle before we say goodbye, and I'm putting you on the spot here, Ben. Top three tips to get to 1,200: play longer time controls and use all your time. I would say study study your end games. Three. Don't forget to analyze your games. If if you've got if you've got excellent, you're good. If, if you've got one hour per day, right? 
the the worst thing that you, you can do is to spend one hour playing. Much, much better would be to do one 15 plus 10 game and then analyze the game. And you will improve much quicker than, than playing 10 games in an hour. Excellent advice, and I co-sign. All right, Ben, it's been great to get to know you. Congrats on uh, on getting to 10K subs and uh, and on the community that you've built. And uh, yeah, I'm, good luck in your game tonight. Thank you, Ben. Much appreciated. Uh, really, really grateful for you having me on. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. First and foremost, to our producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank our presenting chess education sponsors, chessable.com. Got to thank the Patreon subs. Uh, Perpetual Chess would not be possible without you all. Uh, be sure to follow us on your social media of choice. I'm at BennyOfficial1 on Twitter, uh, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram. You can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the conversation with interview subjects. To email me, it's ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And be sure that you are sub to the Perpetual Chess Link Fest. It is a Substack newsletter that you can Google to find. Every week I send out the best chess news stories that I have read the prior week, including lots of good chess improvement advice. Uh, so that should be everything. Thanks for listening, everyone. And we will catch you all next week.